do we realize what all just happened? Star Trek? Today on Trekland Tuesdays Live, number 224, with me, Dr. Trek, Larry Nemechek, coming at you live, as we do every Tuesday, right here from the portal through Trekland, the heart of Trekland, to bring some clarity, sanity, and the big picture to everything Star Trek. Here we are, and no small thanks to all of our Patreons. Hey, here they are, our TTLers and our live wires. Thanks to you all. Lots going on today. Hey, if you are a regular here on Tuesdays, you know I'm going to get off on a little rant here or a little update today. Hey, everybody, it is so good to see everyone again. Yeah, did we realize what just happened Star Trek? Now, yes, we had all the casting bombshells from last Star Trek day. It's been almost a week. All of those announcements, especially Strange New Worlds, was melting down Twitter. Uh, yes, Uhura and Chapel as characters. Mabenga, and I called that <laughs> six months ago when the casting was announced. Yeah, uh, and Anunian hyphen sung? Uh, what is that all about? That really melted down uh, the interwebs. Uh, the chatter was out. Yes, uh, Lower Decks continues to amaze and delight and wear out pause buttons on every piece of mobile device anywhere ever assembled. Yes, all that is happening. Yes, we know that Prodigy is coming October 28th. And yes, we know that we're going to have Star Trek overlap because Disco Season 4 is starting November 18th. So I guess people think you can walk and chew gum, watch a half-hour cartoon and a full-hour drama at the same time. Because there's going to be many, many episodes of, Dis of Prodigy overlapping with Disco, with Picard to follow sometime in early 2022, I'm sure. And yes, we know that Picard Season 3 is filming back-to-back -back with Season 2. They just wrapped Season 2. And yes, we know that Alex Kurtzman, good old Alex, openly talked about the Starfleet Academy show as if to knock down those rumors that it had drifted away. They want to stick with the five, five that they've got going now, almost no overlap to avoid burnout, short seasons. But the Starfleet Academy is still around and that he even sees it as a time to examine that period of life, older teenagers becoming adults, what that means, how they can be a fresh blood on the establishment, shake things up, but at the same time, what they can learn from an older generation as well, and have that be the dramatic, you know, the tipping point of the episodes, which is great, which is way better than 90210 soap opera. <laughs> I'm all for that. And it also speaks a lot to the critical point in history that we are right now. Yes, yes, we know all that too. And we know that, hey, as of Saturday night, the creative the creative Emmys, as if acting and writing, directing aren't creative, but the creative arts Emmys, yay, shout out to Discovery's uh, visual effects team. Winning uh, Emmy, the nominated show was Sukal. All the weird planetary castle, you know, all the poly, all that stuff. And yeah, Jason Zimmerman's the head of that team. He's the visual, he's a supervising producer and the lead on the visual text uh, supervisor. But shout out to his whole team, everybody listed on the ballot: Ante Dekovic, supervisor; Alexandra Kachowska, visual effects producer; Charles Collier, lead effects artist; Alexander Wood, the onset visual effects supervisor, which used to just be the visual effects supervisor in the old days, and Ivan Kondrup Jensen, Kristen Prawl, Tony Priyakarimi, sorry, and Leslie Chung from the other from the, some of the other vendors there, Crafty Apes, DNEG. Ghost Visual Effects, full team of uh, nine folks on that Emmy nomination. Everybody took home brass, so congrats to Discovery for doing that. Yes, that happened. And yes, Michelle Hurd, our very own Raffi now on Picard, just won a very special SAG After Award, SAG After the Union for Actors Who Appear on Camera, won a special President's Award for service because the service she did in both establishing safety regs on set for cast and crew during the pandemic and also helping to create um, an app called Safe Place, a reporting system that's both credible and safely anonymous for people to report sexual harassment issues on set post Me Too, uh, which has been a quiet little thing hasn't really trumpeted that until the announcement of this award. So if you've heard Michelle talk now in the year or so of virtual and now live, she is 
<laughs> she does not stay quiet when it comes to the issues she cares about. And here's the case where she's not just talking the talk, walking the walk. So congrats to Michelle Hurd on that. That's amazing. An award from your peers is always something. And yes, that happened. And yes, uh, did you hear about the retool of the Roddenberry Centennial plans that the foundation, the Roddenberry Foundation is coming out with? It's, it's now the Boldly Go campaign. It's being teamed up with, it's in affiliation with CBS or Paramount Plus, we need to get used to saying. Did you have a hard time switching from Paramount to CBS 12 years ago? Are you having a hard time switching back from CBS to Paramount Plus? It's a funny world. <laughs> Pendulum swings. Yeah. But the, the foundation is going to be working with the tech company Otoy, which is run by a friend of uh, Rod, so it's great they can team up. Um, they're going to have everybody submit just your, your messages, photos, videos of what you want to see the world look like in 100 years, right? Hashtagging it boldly go 100. This is all part of boldlygo.org. They're going to put that together into a virtual art piece, combine all that. Um, it'll be available to the public and auctioned uh, real life. All the proceeds would go to nonprofits. Um, it's it's trying to it's trying to turn all of our Star Trek good hopes wishes aspirations all that we love Star Trek for giving back to us trying to make that something tangible not not just for the art piece but to something then turn that into bucks that can go to people making that happen in real life which is an obvious which is which is an obvious but it's a it's an awesome awesome project they're even talking about uh, partnering with uh, satellite company Planet. They're going to etch that artwork onto some of their satellites, launch them into space next year. Um, it would be the first space-based art installation. I mean, yes, they're doing work. It would not be more space junk, space debris. But it would be that in space. So, it, yes. So, kudos. If you did not hear about that, the Boldly Go campaign from the Roddenberry Foundation uh, partnered with Paramount Plus and others. And all these tech ends trying to make real world sense of the Roddenberry legacy and everything Star Trek. That happened, but two other things. I mentioned this briefly last week going into Star Trek Day because we were so swept up in it, it took me a minute. Five years ago, we saw the biggest Star Trek event ever, really, globe spanning, the 50th, right? I called it 5 0 fever. The biggest Vegas Trek event ever, the first mission, New York, the first mission from Reed Pop, who now has the license for official virtual, for official cons. We saw that, that we saw the destination treks in Europe take hold and had produced big 50th anniversary cons as well. It was a big year for advertisers, right? May, going mainstream, bringing Trek to the mainstream audience. It was a huge year. It's just that two or three days before anniversary day on the 8th, I realized that there was nothing for anybody to do. <laughs> on the 8th, there was no marking of the 8th aside from everybody just hashtagging it and tweeting it, right? Posting about it. Just here locally, I thought we should do something. So I went over to Lucy's, Lucy's El Adobe Cafe, which is the last little Hollywood diner hangout watering hole. It's a good restaurant too across from Paramount from the old days. And I went in and talked to them. Uh, one of the channels, I forget which, was running, was streaming Star Trek episodes, original series on the 8th in 2016. I just asked them if I had 20, maybe, you know, 30, 40 people coming in, just an open invitation, uh, if they could do a drink special and if we could turn all the TVs on, which they did. It was a what a Wednesday night, a Thursday night. Nobody cared. Nothing else was going on. There was certainly no new Star Trek happening in 2016, right? It was a full year before Discovery premiered. It was five years ago, and not only was no new Star Trek happening, nothing was marking the day, which was usual. That's what we'd always had. We always used to say, happy Star Trek anniversary, happy birthday. Hey, happy Star Trek birthday to each other went online to tweeting and Facebooking then, but that's all we used to do. I felt the 50s should do something just in our own little local way, local LA way, as other clubs and groups did around the country in some part. All I did was make a big birthday card, <laughs> took the original artwork there 
and just had a card that people could come in and sign. Just said, here's a place, everybody. Come hang out. Come talk track. Meet some new friends. And there were lots of new faces. I was thrilled. And everybody signing. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I just had this stuck away. I got to do something with this. I saved it. And I had not retrieved it. I had not gone back to get it physically or literally or mentally until it dawned on me this huge Star Trek day now is what we call it of last week. After two or three years here with the pandemic driven of being virtual, having virtual panels. Yay. Now it's now someone has lit the light bulb that it's a great marketing day on top of first contact day. It's not con driven. It's totally within the, even, even a license convention. It's a date, no matter what's happening in the world. Paramount Plus now can, can market, can present fans some really exclusive content, can partner up and have some really big opportunities all in the name of Star Trek in, in good works. And yeah, sure, merchandise, sure, what the hell. And even donate that off to charity, which is what happened, both virtually now and in the pandemic. We talked about this last week as being the first is being a continuing build here of the last few years, going back to the very first time the studio did anything, which wasn't until the 20th anniversary. And then it was a big way and a big explosion. That was one history that was fun to trace. But it, the bigger picture is, look what's just happened in five years. Of course, that parallels the whole idea of, look what's just happened with actual filmed on-screen Star Trek in five years. We finally got it back. Weekly, weekly, I know the Calvin movies were in there, but they they weren't the same. I'm not even talking about the content of the movies. As I said in 2006, I'm just talking about the fact that they were movies, not weekly episodes, not small screen adventures, not extended stories, which is Star Trek's first best destiny, if you ask me. That's, that's why it was created. That's why we're aboard her. So it was great to see this evolution since 2016, which at the time we thought was the end all be all of everything Star Trek. Oh my God, look what all is being done this year. What a huge, a sellout convention in Vegas. My God, what's going, what could, what could top this? Well, aside from having actual Star Trek back and different flavors of Star Trek, look at what the, what the studio has seized. And yeah, it's all for marketing. It's, it's, it's selling the shows, but look, this is Star Trek. We all, we all pat each other's backs. We wash each other. <laughs> You know, uh, it's the fan. It's it's bringing more fans in and reaching a mainstream audience, a more mainstream audience, and bringing more people in. And yes, now we're going into animation and getting older teens. And now, hopefully, with Prodigy, we'll have the kids in, whether or not they were birthed by Trekkie parents or not. It is a brand new. It is a strange new world. It's a brave new world. It's an exciting new world. And the barometer is is as much about Star Trek Day as anything. Look what has just happened in five years. There was nothing happening official in LA except my little party at Lucy's in 2016. And look what we had last week, locally live, as well as beaming around the world. Now, that was something, that was something. I wanted to share that. Did you realize what's been going on? Did you see what's been out there? Do you realize what all just happened? One more. One more that's a real feel-good story, because um, for the last several months, I um, you may not know his name. I've mentioned him here many times just to try to help with his GoFundMe for medical and housing expenses. But Michael Braveheart was on screen for the last six years of Next Generation and the first two movies, first with Dr. Pulaski. And then with Gates, with Dr. Crusher in sick bay as the main go-to nurse you saw, male nurse. It was an incident first, then you could see was promoted to lieutenant by the end of the movies. Got a name mentioned at one point, finally, finally, Martinez. Maybe someday we'll have a first name for him. It hasn't been retconned in a novel somewhere. But Michael Braveheart, who I he was the ideal candidate to be a Portal 47 member. I'd never talked to him back in the day. We'd never done an interview. But when I started Portal 47 and wanted to hear the backstagers' insights and stories and, yes, texture, the total Star Trek experience, which is what Portal is all about, I finally reached out, got in touch with him after we'd talked back and forth for a day because he was living back in New York. Come to find out he was really having some health issues. He'd been fine until the pandemic 
uh, had some chronic heart issues and then got into housing issues and and just the pandemic and you know ubering everywhere not drive anyway he was in dire straits even with assistance and started a GoFundMe campaign that we found out about and helped try to help boost. Well, he's upped his total a couple of times. We have been talking about it off and on in my channels the last few years. And most of the people who've donated to him have been Trek folks. And he's always, he may have a trouble now, but he's always responded in kind with a note. Sometimes he's even sent a little memento from his Trek days to, to the donors early on. He may run out of things though, because Here's the last thing that I want to make sure you saw happening this week. It's such a feel-good story. So his birthday was actually September 11th. He and a ton of Trek folks had birthdays on September 11th. A slight redemption for an otherwise sad day, aside from uh, my stepdaughter's birthday is the 11th. So we're used to this, and we're used to seeing you know the good come with days. But Michael's health issues, I know we're tinging that. He turned 71. He's back in L.A., his uh, GoFundMe is helping out a little, but I knew, and all the donors are Star Trek folks. So on wishing him a birthday on my socials, I mentioned the GoFundMe campaign. Well, a couple days later, look what happens. Now, other than his old boss, <laughs> the good Dr. Beverly, Gates McFadden retweeted our birthday message and said she was sorry to hear she was making a donation and was really sweet. It was really sweet about it. Well, you know what happened, though? Since she retweeted this and, and pointed it out, well, there's been nearly 150 people come, anything from five bucks to another hundred or 200, all kinds of 20s and 50s. It's all good. It's all good. His total was barely at half of his goal, but then it, then it was under. He's up to now $4,600 toward his 7,000 goal, where he had been at about 2,500 24 hours ago. It's just amazing. It just, you know, you just, it's all what I always say. You know, there's a lot of them out there, but you just have to find the right doctor sometimes. And I know he's heartened. He hasn't responded online yet. I don't know if he's even seen. I was going to email Michael here in a little bit, but this is all just blown up in the last day or so. It's, it's just really heartwarming. And it shows you the power of um, <laughs> what some blue check folks have over some of the rest of us anyway so very sweet very wonderful of gates to done to done that herself and to boost the signal right so it's if you want to go find it it's it's gofundme at the actually it's friends of michael braveheart is the campaign and it's just amazing that this is this is basically doubled <laughs> in the last day day and a half uh, just a really good feel good story. The bottom line is I hope Michael's feeling good. He just needs some therapy, some healings, a little housing assistance. He, he taught acting and did everything himself, which went out the window in the pandemic and everything just kind of, uh, spiraled a little bit there on it. So great story. Wonderful moment there. That's the good side of social media of infinite diversity. That's the power of the Star Trek family doing good. I just wanted to point that out. That was a little story that hasn't had time to percolate up on top of all these other ones. Yeah. Do you realize what all just happened, Star Trek? It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. And we're almost due for another, for the wrap up of this. We're halfway through the Lord X season now even. And by all promises and accounts, it's going to get crazy even topping the way last first season ended. So we can't wait for that too. Good on Gates. And we're hanging in there for you, Michael. Uh, we're going to get you as a guest on Portal yet, Michael. We are. And good on the entire Star Trek community. So much stuff happening here. And it's not even show-driven. So hopefully, it's not the same old, same old you're getting everywhere when you come in here to Trekland Tuesdays Live. I just want to say, again, thanks to our Patreons, right? The TTL Club, Blaze K, Robin Wilson, Lawrence Todd, Anne-Marie Siegel, Keith Rombach, Justin Porteous, Nathaniel Robinson, and J.R. Poole. Thank you, folks. And our live wires, Rusty Harrell, Halbjord Gunn Johnson, Jalen Bullock, Robert McLean, Alan Hohensey, and Casey Shafsky. Thanks so much, guys, gals, and peeps. If you want to jump into, it's very simple, patreon.com slash Live. Five bucks, ten bucks. I have a very simple Patreon. Get in by the end of the month. It, they bill you. It's a shout out from me. 
and access to some of our earlier Portal 47 interviews. Uh, Salt Lake, Fan X Salt Lake, the con formerly known as Salt Lake Comic Con, is this weekend back live and in full glory, totally masked and totally, um, to whether you're vaccinated or not and showing signs, but everybody being masked. This will be interesting as well. Um, a lot of folks have been going on. Vegas happened, and then Sci-Fi Summit creation in New Jersey. Rose City Comic Con happened in Portland. There are more on the way. We will see. We will see as we creep back into this, okay? As we do that, just a reminder that uh, The Trek Files is back. This week, a new guest, somebody you've read his ye words for years. You've rarely heard him unless you've been in person, say, at Vegas. Can't wait for you to get over and... <laughs> Ian, Ian, Sp I always want to say Ian Fleming. No, Ian Spelling, uh, the longtime editor, former editor of Star Trek.com. I've known him since the companion days when he had a syndicated column, and I thought that was awesome for Star Trek. He's our guest this week talking about his first interview that we found in the Trek Files with Gene from 1986. It was his third piece to ever sell. Um, yeah, some thoughts about that moment and uh, his new book that's coming out, Star Trek, A Celebration, a 55-year history on the original series with Ben Robinson coming out from Hero Collector. Um, but check out Trek Files today. It's a new episode, as always, on Tuesdays with your Tuesday Tuvers, podcasts.roddenberry.com. That's where the paperwork is. That's where the documents are. But you can catch it wherever fine podcasts are caught, okay? The Trek Files on Facebook, that is. is the hub. And, of course... Saturday, we have a day off on Life Support Live this week. Dr. Ali and Dr. Trek, one of us is a real doctor, but we'll be going, boldly going through uncertain times a week from Saturday. But this Sunday is a fill-in Zoomy Chatty, uh, <laughs> Zoomy Chatty thing led by our moderator, Jared. So if you go over, go over to the Facebook page, all the info is there. It's kind of a substitute when Ali and I don't do a live show on a Saturday. We did our Sunday show because of schedules. Um, we started this thing in the pandemic, guys. And who knew that people would actually be having to do other things eventually on Saturdays? Hey, everybody. Other than that, it's just at Larry Nimichuk on Twitter. I'd love to have you join me. I get into other things besides Star Trek there. <laughs> Football and politics and Will Rogers and what have you. But it's Larry Nimichek's Trekland, as you found out now on YouTube and Facebook. And yes, Instagram, too. Doing a lot more. We're building out the channels. If you enjoyed today the way I go at Star Trek, join us in the portal, portal47.net. It is like a mini-con all year long. We were doing virtual meetups and events and communication and community long before the pandemic. But the portal is way more than just uh, Zoom meetups, right? We're digging and finding those folks like Michael, hopefully, like uh, like all those folks back there, all those folks who made Star Trek what it is for all the Star Trek you have no idea that you have no idea about. That's it for now. If you're leaving us on YouTube, I just want to please, please ask you, plead with you, stay healthy, do all the things. Stay woke. Keep your mind open to the things you haven't learned yet, to the fact that who you're chatting with may be a troll. Don't waste your time. Check the sources of everything. Most of all, trek well, everybody. <laughs>